you are the eternal God. And we're so grateful. You are listening. You do move with the sound of our voice. You love us. You know each of us individually. The fact that you would even hear our cry. We're so grateful, God. We're so grateful, God. I believe the direction that God gave us for this year through Pastor C was true and it's important. Victory by going through in 2022. Unfortunately, that implies that we have more to go through. Now, Pastor C could have just sat up and come up with something cute that would make us feel good like more goodies for you in 2022. But we're not just here to hear a word that's soothing and comforting. and We're here to speak what we hear from the Lord. And we want to have ears so we can hear from God. He's obviously not talking about just the physical ears, but we need spiritual ears Amen. so we can hear what God is saying in this time. Yes. The Lord is preparing and equipping the body of Christ that will listen to be victorious in the midst of the mess. The Lord is sending messages and tools and strength. He's sending help to get us ready. He's raising up an army of soldiers. So most of us, including me, we all got to grow up real quick. Now, I feel bad that the Lord had to allow me to almost die before I would wake up and listen. But I'm so grateful, honey. <laughs> I'm so grateful. Please listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you in this season, in every area, about everything. Not about what this person said or what that person is doing or what the doctor says, the lawyer, the teacher, the politician, the anybody. Lord, say, Lord, let me hear your voice for my life. Let me do what you're saying for me. We want to have that undistracted devotion. Now, I'm going to teach you a little bit today. This message is called Stay in Your Lane. And I've been hearing from that from the Holy Ghost a lot lately. Stay in your lane. And if you're driving down a road or you're running on the track like an athlete, they give you a lane to stay in. And... If you start crossing over in other people's lanes, you're going to cause crashes and, and injuries and collisions. Amen. So when you tell somebody to stay in your lane, it means you have a course and you need to stay within the boundaries of that prescribed course. I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary. I was surprised it was in there. And it says, stay in your lane is a slang phrase. <laughs> and it's similar to... M-Y-O-B, that's what my sons used to tell me. Mind your own business. I'm like, what? <laughs> M-Y-O-B. Tell a person, you're telling the person, focus on what you're good at and what you're called to do. They said that it was, and early on, it was a phrase that came from football. Stay in your lane was a phrase that was advice to worry only about your own assignment and don't take on the job of defending a different opponent, opponent because it can lead to chaos. Now, you know, the Apostle Paul knew something about the Olympics. So we had Super Bowl and now the Olympics. And he knew something about the athletic games in his time. I read an article about Paul that says he would have known about the Olympic games. They were every four years in Greece. He also knew about the Isthmian Games. They were every other year. They were almost as important as the Olympic Games. And they were very close to Corinth, near the Corinthian church. So Paul would understand the excitements about the Olympic Games. They would get the city ready. They knew more income would come into the city. The athletes were working hard, training. They would be bragging about who would have more medals. Uh, they would even affect the politics because they would have truces at that time so they could have the games. 
And it seems like Paul really liked the Olympics. He used to use several, he used several examples about them that talked about our growth and our success as children of God. So he wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race, the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air. But I punish my body and enslave it so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. And I said, Lord Jesus, help me. Yes. Now, this is an area where I'm being challenged right now by the Lord. And when I think about the lifestyle of an athlete, it's a grueling lifestyle of self-sacrifice. It's a lifestyle of discipline. And they would do all that to get a ribbon with a medal on it. Now, you know, I've been in God's school of obedience now more intensely since my operation in 2019. And I've been getting some deliverance in my own life as the Lord has been directing me to deal with some issues in my life, deal with some fears. And he's dealing with and breaking some of the generational curses in my life. And he told me the other day that deliverance is needed when you're dealing with a bondage that's reinforced by the demonic. See, we all got bondage, but sometimes that bondage is reinforced by the demonic, especially when it comes down your family line. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. There's some things that came to you when you were in your mama's womb. You didn't have nothing to do with it. Yeah. But it says the sins of the father are visited to the children, to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. Yeah. Now, the good part is it also says, but he'll bless thousands of them that love him. Yeah. So there's blessings that come down, but there are also cursings that come down. But once you have deliverance, you need discipline to maintain your deliverance. Yes, Christians can experience bondage. 2 Timothy 2, 19 tells us, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house... There are not only vessels of gold or silver, but also wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So it tells you, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness Faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, you know, Paul wrote a whole bunch of chapters and books in the Bible. He was a great man of God. But he tells you that he, he even had a struggle dealing with his two natures. See, when you get saved, you get a, a new nature. You had the old nature, that you, but you get a new nature once you get saved. So in Romans 7, 25, in the Living Bible, it says, but there is something else deep within me, in my lower nature, that is at war with my mind and wins the fight and makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. In my mind, I want to be God's willing servant, but instead I find myself still enslaved to sin. So you see how it is. My new life tells me to do right, but the old nature that is still there inside me loves to sin. Oh, what a terrible predicament I'm in. Who will free me from my slavery to this deadly lower nature? Then he says, thank God. It has been done by Jesus Christ our Lord. He has set me free. Baby girl was just singing about he set me free. Now, I'm noticing in the last days there's a lot of judgment and judging in the body of Christ. There's a self-righteous spirit. I don't know if you notice it, but, but I'm not living that life no more. I ain't got time. 
I don't have time to try to fix you. I got to stay in my lane. I got too much that's got to be fixed in me. I got to stay in my lane. And even in Revelation, the Lord tells us, be zealous and repent. Almost dying affected me. As I said, I don't have time to get you straight no more. I'm focused. It's like, Lord, I got to do what you say do. I have to finish my course. I got to complete what you said do. My time is limited. I got to finish. I got to work out my own soul salvation. I know ministries where they think it's their whole ministry to tear down other churches and other pastors. Instead of praying for them, even if you think they're wrong. We ain't got time to be, this was wrong and this was focus. Lord, fix me. If there's something wrong with them, I'll pray for them. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. But focus on you. Because when you stand before God, it will not be about your husband, what he did and didn't do. It will not be about your wife, what she did and she didn't do. It's not going to be about your mama, your pastor, the police, the white man, the black man, the red man, or nobody else. God's going to say, what did I tell you to do? We got to give an account for us alone. Now, years ago, the Lord told me about a familiar spirit. That's a family line spirit. It's a controlling spirit. He needed me to be delivered from it. And it came down to me from grandfathers on both sides of my family. So I prayed. I repented for my sins and the sins of my forefathers. And I felt a weight lift off of me. Now, the Lord let me know I still had to walk in obedience and discipline in that area. So lately, as I told you, I've been hearing the Lord say, stay in your lane. Sometimes we're in other people's lanes, and sometimes we're in God's lane. You're like, oh, excuse me, this is my job. You know, now wives, sometimes we feel like it's our job to convict our husbands of sin. And the Lord say, excuse me, that's my son. This your lane. You do what I told you to do. Amen. Yeah, I know it's hard. <laughs> I know it's hard. But you got a race. I got a race. We all have a race to run, and we have to run it with patience. Amen. Also, when I look at Christians today, sometimes it seems like they're not conscious of the fact that God is watching us. Now, you all know, we all know Christians in leadership, big name folk who are living all kind of ways. If you don't know, I, let me let you know. A lot of folk that got TV programs and their own planes and huge churches, some of them, I'm not gonna say a lot of them, some of them, living rusty and dusty. All right, all right. And I just keep praying, Lord, let them repent. Lord, let them repent. I am so glad that I have the fear of God and it is increasing. Yeah, yeah. If you have the fear of God, you need to be grateful. That's a gift. Yeah. That's the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You need to put that in your children. My mom and daddy put that fear of the Lord in me. You know, I was up at camp one, one year, and I think I was about 14, 13, and all the junior council was going to go across the camp. It was a Christian camp. They were going to raid the kitchen. And I started out walking with them at night, and I said, ooh, ooh, God watching me. I said, like, no, y'all, I can't go. I can't go. God is watching. So you want your children to have a fear of the Lord. You can't hide from him. You cannot con him. He is not impressed with the things that you use to influence other people. You know, we all have ways of influencing people. You know, even as little girls, they look up to their daddy and give him the eyes. Daddy, I'm sorry. You know, you know, we know how to con. We all have our ways. I tried being pitiful with God. It don't work. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work. I'm like, Lord, do I have to do this really? Please, don't you love me? It don't work on God. Some of us love playing the victim. And then others of us try to tell God what you will and will not do. I did that for a while. I said, for 20 years, we will not pastor. Mm-mm. We knew pastors close up and personal, honey. I know some of them be people you be turning on and watching on TV. We know some of them personally. I'm like, no, no, I know their pain. This is not fun. This is not cute. We ain't going to do that. And the Lord said, excuse me? Who's God here? 
And I had to say, yes, Lord. And he told me, do it and do it with the right attitude. I'm like, yes, Lord. The Lord gets all up in my grill. Sometimes he gets rough with me. I'm like, yes, Lord, I'm sorry. You're right. I humble myself. I wanted to show you a picture on the PowerPoint, but there was a picture of a little girl. I was looking through PowerPoints and uh, things on the web for a picture, and I saw this picture of this little black girl, and she's sitting down with her legs crossed, and the background is just kind of foamy and fuzzy, and she's looking up at this light, and I said, that was me three years ago in God's presence, just a little baby girl looking up to Jesus, feeling his love all around me. It was freeing. Your in God's presence, your little titles don't mean nothing. Who you know, where you've been, that don't mean nothing. It's just you and him. You're his child. He loves you. He sees the core of you. All that other stuff is frill, honey. It don't mean nothing. It's temporary. It passes away. I also had the overwhelming knowledge that God knows me completely. Not only the number of hairs on my head, but he knows my soul, my heart, my spirit. He knows my motives, my feelings, and my thoughts. He knows everything about me. He also knew I was trying. I'm like, Lord, you know. He told me in September of 2019, he let me know that he was dealing with me about the sin of trying to help God. And I'm like, Lord, you're right. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And I start trying to delegate stuff, you know, because I was going to fix it and make everything right. Everybody going to be right. And Lord, like, excuse me, I don't need your help. And he knew I was trying. So when I stood in God's presence, he said, this will help you to the next level. He knew I was trying. So there was nothing to say. And I'm so grateful for the experience. I call it Jayola the Reset. Because it helped me to be more aware of the spirit realm. So all of a sudden, all the stuff I learned in Sunday school, I'm like, okay, stuff. this stuff is real. This God we serve is real, and he's way more powerful than what we know, honey. We got God like he's little, just like he's just a little bit stronger than the devil. This is, child, he's so big and so awesome. We just don't even understand. We don't know who we're serving. We don't understand. Much of the scripture is about helping us to be more aware of the spirit realm. You know, if any of you watch the movie The Matrix, you know Neo, the, type, the person in the Matrix movie, he was a given a chance to be set free. He realized he was born in a computer program and that the world looked different from what it really was. He saw certain things in the computer program he thought was the world. But when they set him free from that fantasy, he saw the way the real world was. And it reminded me of Revelations 3.17. God talking about this age of church. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not thou that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See, we see one thing, but God sees what's in the real world. One Bible teacher said that being carnal is just focusing on the world. Now, we have to be reminded occasionally that we are in this world, but we are not of the world. I'm going to say it again. We are in this world, but as a child of God, we are not of the world. If you've accepted Jesus, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. It's a good thing to remember that because that's what's going to help you make it through in the dangerous times that we're coming on. 2 Corinthians 4.16, for which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, what is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, it tells us in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal or temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. Now this is important for you, saints. Listen, listen. At the end of the days, at the end of life, 
You're going to need this so you don't lose heart. Verse 16 in the New K version. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Now, you get a certain age and you realize, okay, my outward man is perishing. You can use youth creams. You can get operations. You can dye the gray. You can tuck it up in surgery. But it's perishing, honey. The important thing is to make sure that your inward man is being renewed day by day. How does your inward man get renewed every day? You got to be intentional about it. Yell out some ways that you know you're making sure your inward man is renewed day by day. The word of God. What else? Prayer. Fasting. Meditation. Worship. Communion, y'all doing good. All of that, prayer, the word of God, even encouraging one another. Praying in the spirit, worship, obeying the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Hebrews 10, 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. The closer it gets to the last days, you're supposed to fellowship even more. The Living Bible in that passage in 1025 of Hebrews says, let us not neglect our church meetings as some people do, but encourage and warn each other especially now that the day of his coming back is drawing near. So a real good measure for yourself. Just think of it this way. If it's something you would do for your job, if there's something you would do for the man, if there's something you would do to make some money, at least do that for your God. Sometimes we'll do stuff for our job And when it comes time to be at church or do something for the church, oh, okay, well, I I can't. That's too much. Another way to know that your inward man is being renewed is prayer. We all said that. I have increased my prayer time. Pray without ceasing. That means you got to be conscious of the Lord all the time. It doesn't mean that you're walking around talking to yourself out loud. I knew a saint that used to do that, used to drive me crazy, trying to be all spiritual. And God, in the name of Jesus, we think, I mean, all day long, all day long. Okay. They look cray-cray. They look a little crazy. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. You can pray in your mind. Amen. When you're in a courtroom or when you're, you know, sometimes it's not appropriate for you to pray out loud, pray in your mind. So don't say, oh, yeah, I'm from Fresh Anointing Christian Center and walking around looking crazy, Okay. (laughs) Don't put that on us. (laughs) We don't need you looking crazy. But yes, you got to be aware of the presence of the Lord all the time and praying in your spirit. And there are some times he'll have you you to pray out loud. Now, Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought. But the spirit itself maketh groanings and intercessions which could not be uttered. On Tuesday night in our corporate prayer, I don't even know who it was. Somebody was on the phone, a mother in Zion, honey. I could feel her interaction and her groaning in the Holy Ghost. I said, okay, this mother been in the presence of God. I could tell. You can tell when folk been in the presence. Something different about their prayers. So another way to renew your spirit is praying in tongues. Mm -hmm, I said it. We edify ourselves. That's what the word says. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth or builds up himself. Now, you know, you can ask the Lord for spiritual gifts. Brothers, the Lord is training me more and more nowadays about different types of tongues. I've been learning about the tongues of men and of angels, unknown tongues, divers' tongues. I've been singing in tongues lately. And I don't mean just a few verses. I'll be singing the chorus and the verse and back to the chorus. And for me to remember what I sang in an unknown language, 
a minute before that had to be God because my memory, <laughs> yeah, that was God. So you can get all denominational on us if you want to, but there's demons out there you got to face, and they ain't impressed with your little degree and what you think you know. We're going to have some hard stuff that we got to deal with, and we're going to have to deal with it from the spirit realm. I want everything I'm supposed to have in this season, every gifting that I need, I need it now. Now, you know, I had a lot of experiences when I was young with dealing with demons. And so I didn't want a seer gift. I didn't want to be a seer. I didn't want to see nothing. I didn't want to see angels. And I'm like, man, I'm not trying to see nothing. And recently, I'm like, all right, Lord, if that's what I need, do whatever I need, you know, just what I need. And I was in the car with Minister Loretta last week, and she turned and looked at me and said, see her. I'm like, see, see, okay. I'm like, all right, Lord. Many times the Lord will give me dreams, and I'll, I can tell when they're from the Holy Spirit, and I'll ask him, what was that about? Any kind of, you ask God for what you don't know about. Ask him to lead you and direct you, give you wisdom. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 says, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Mark 16, 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Another way that we renew our spirits in Hebrews 3, 12 is talking to other Christians. We need to encourage one another. We need that fellowship. Hebrews 3.12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He's talking to Christians. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened with the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Yeah. Now, don't use COVID as an excuse to think you can just drop out of your spiritual race. Your enemy is not on vacation. In fact, he's stepping up his program. You know folks is dropping dead all around you. This is time to stay connected to the Lord and the body of Christ. You can do it on Zoom. You can call your friend. You can be up in church. However you do it, be on the line with prayer on Wednesday Bible study. Don't be sitting at home by yourself where the devil gets you up, backed up against the wall and beating you up and then saying, I'm so depressed. I don't know why. Duh. You're, get with the body of Christ. Get with other people growing in God and getting stronger in God. Get where the word is going forth. Okay, so the outward man is perishing, but what you need to do is renew your inward man day by day, so you need to do something spiritual for your spiritual man every day. But when you spend 90% of your time and focus and energy and life force on what is temporary, that's carnal. Now, it doesn't mean you ignore the world. Everything in the world is not evil, it's just temporary. You got to go to the store, you got to do your hair, you got to get your kids ready for school, you got to vote, you got to go to work, you got to have some fun. You can go to the beach, go fishing, that's fine. Just know that it's temporary. We are in this world, we must participate, but one of the laws of God's kingdom is the law of dominion. The law of dominion says that spirits without physical bodies of dirt are illegal on earth unless they're functioning through a human. That's why a demon's always looking for a person to be in. That's why when Jesus cast them out, they said, well, just send us to the pigs. They're looking for a body. That's why the Lord even says, I, be I beseech you, present your body a living sacrifice. God even wants to operate through your body, through you. He wants to use you. Now, it's foolish just to focus on this world and make your decisions and your life plans based on a temporary world. We are getting ready for eternity. Look at your neighbor, tell them, we are getting ready 
for eternity. Look at somebody else. We are getting ready for eternity. You have to think about what you're doing right now and how it's going to impact your eternity. There's a reason for everything you're going through. This world is spiritual. The world is spiritual. You know, sometimes I think we think it's political, economical, psychological, scientific, social, all them other things. The world is spiritual. That's the core of everything starts in the spirit realm. That's where stuff starts first. The good thing is that God has given us tools to impact the spirit realm. That's why getting saved was so important to me. When I was depressed as a child, I was 11, 12 years old, and I was depressed because I realized that everything was short and temporary. My mindset at 11, 12 was, okay, big deal. You grow up, you go to college, you find a husband, have some kids, and you die. That's the way I thought. I'm like, well, what's, what's the point? Isn't there something more? There got to be something more. But then I got saved. And that's when the eternal light of God came into my soul. And I was like, yes, Lord, this is it. This is not just temporary. I want to live for something that will last forever. Amen. I want something that's going to be eternal. I want to serve your purpose. Jesus died to give you a choice. And some people don't understand this. Some people think God is saying, okay, okay, you go to hell, you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell. No. When Adam sinned, everybody was in the loins of Adam, every human being. When he sinned, we were all doomed to die and go to hell. There was no options. Everybody, no matter how cute the little baby is, all of us were doomed to go to hell. Jesus went through all of this stuff to make sure you had a choice. He said, Behold, I said before you life and death. Now you get to choose. You were already on your way to hell. We were dead men walking, all of us. On our way to hell. No, no choice. Jesus said, I'm interrupting this scene. I'm making a choice for you so you can choose life and live in eternity with me. But it's your choice. He's not going to make you. It's your choice. Adam was the father of us all. And his sin messed us up. The best decision you will ever make is choosing Jesus. Saying yes to him. Yes to eternity with him. To me, it's just a new point. I mean, it's duh. It's an easy. If somebody tell you life and death, why do you choose death? That's just kind of dumb. Okay? Choose life. But he even tells you in the verse, he'll tell you, Psst, choose life. Some people might even be foolish enough to choose that, but choose life. But everyone, I want you to take note, everyone in heaven will not have the same quality of life. Ooh. The Lord talks about judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, and some works, people's works being burned up. He talks about some folk getting 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. He talks about some people getting crowns. Yeah, yeah. Carnal Christians are those that spend all of their life and energy focusing on the world. That's all they do. Mm. My job, my house, my husband, my children, my career. My... You got to do that, but you got to go back to the core first yeah. and know that everything comes from God. Yeah. Some of us have a tendency, because we're so impressed with the world, we get excited about the world. Oh, man is doing great things. And man, I mean, you know, they can give you a new heart. They can take a lung out of one person's body and put it in your body. I mean, man can do some, you know, amazing things. But God created the man like this. He's the one that created the man. So it's important that we bring every, don't bring from the world stuff to God and say, Lord, here's my political suggestion. You think this will help? Don't bring from the world, here's my economic suggestion. Lord, you think this will help you? He don't need your help, baby. He don't need your help. We got to get in his presence and hear from him. He got all the answers. He has all of them. 
What we got to do is say, Lord, I don't know nothing. I cannot do anything without you. I come before you. I humble myself. Acknowledge him in all of your ways, and he will direct your path, even in little things. Ladies, God knows the best way to put your makeup on, the best way to fix your hair. He knows little stuff. He's really cool, okay? <laughs> God knows good stuff. He knows the best way to plant that, that seed so that the best kind of fruit will come out. And if you ask him, he'll direct you in even little things. I love when God does that little stuff for me because it's that special stuff that's just for me. When we were building our house, they told us that all of the master bedrooms would be on the left side of the house. And for some reason, when I walked into the model, like, I want my bedroom on the right side. It just felt right. It just flowed with me. So I'm like, oh, well. And after they were building on the house for a while, they called me and they said, Mr. and Mrs. Walker, we're so sorry to tell you, but because of the way your house is positioned on the lot, your bedroom is going to have to be on the right side of the house. <laughs> OK, see, really? Jesus, you just sweet. You just sweet. You do that little sweet stuff for me where he lets you know, this was just for you, baby, because I love you. God is so sweet. The other week, I'm going to tell on Pastor C. Pastor C was laying around. It was a Thursday, so he wasn't at dialysis. And he has a tendency, sometimes he's tired, he just wants to lay around. And I'm like, come on, man, get up. You got to move around. Get up. Move, move. And I had been sitting and studying, and I felt like I needed to get up and move around, and, you know, because I'd be at the computer all day. Like, get up. So for some reason, I said to Alexa, my little computer thing, I said, Alexa, play James Brown. All right now. All right now. And Alexa played, get up off of that thing. And dance so you feel better. Get up off of that thing. And so I danced around to my husband. I said, get up off of that thing. And dancing, you feel better. I said, you see how God is talking to you through Alexa? He said, that pagan music, that ain't God. <laughs> now, I don't listen to James Brown. I only play worship music. I don't know why I said for Alexa to play James Brown. I don't know why. That was a Thursday. Two days later, Sunday morning, Elder Tony Jenkins is talking about the man who they opened the roof and let him down. And Jesus told him to take up your bed and walk. And Elder Tony Jenkins said, what Jesus was really saying was, get up off of that thing and dance till you feel better. And I hit my husband. Lord, Lord said, don't hit him. He heard it. I said, oh, okay, okay. I started to say, see, I told him. I said, okay, okay. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. The Lord is an awesome God. Now, carnal Christians are those, as I said, that spend all their time focusing only on this life. And Esau was a great example. Esau was the oldest son, and he was supposed to get the blessing of the firstborn, the birthright. But in Genesis 25, 32, Esau said, behold, he had been out hunting and sweating, and he was hungry, he comes back in. Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do for me? He's talking to Jacob because he wanted to give him some food. He's like, I don't care about no birthright. I need some food now. I'm hungry. It was so bad that Esau was talked about in the New Testament. Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and here, thereby being defiled. And verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Wow. Now, it's sad to disregard what will bring eternal blessings to satisfy our flesh and our desires to be satisfied right now. Wow. Second Corinthians 4.17 talks about for light, this our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and ex eternal weight of glory. Now, I know it's hard, but we got to resist what we want right now in the flesh for eternal reasons. Amen. 
Yeah. And I know it's hard, brothers. I know it's hard. Folk get more naked every day. Huh? Hang in there, hold on, it's hard. Married people, I know it's hard. The devil tempts you with other folk. Hold on, hold on, it's hard. But for an eternal weight of glory, don't give in. Single people, I understand. Jesus understood. Stay pure before God for an eternal weight of glory. Now, I know some of us feel like we're being tortured if somebody talks about us. But there are literally Christians today who are being tortured for the name of Christ. This is not way back in the day, so this is today. In China, North Korea, there's people in the persecuted church where they have sold out everything for Jesus, and they are willing to give their lives, and they will not back down. But even if you're in prison being tortured for Christ for years, compared to being tortured for eternity, it's light. To be tortured for eternity in hell, that's torture forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It'd be better to be tortured for Christ for right now for a moment and get eternity in heaven with him. So at death, you step out of time and you step into the spirit realm and your suffering for God is going to work for you a far greater weight of eternal glory. That's why the word says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in you. Yes. It's not even worthy to compare it. Do what God tells you to do. Keep on pressing through the trials, the pain, the ups and the downs. Focus on him. Obey him. You will be blessed in eternity. He will give you joys you never even knew about, stuff you never even understood. Do not get stuck in the temporary. Some of us get all upset, upset and upset and concerned about rich folk. It look like they're succeeding them. You know, the word tells us, fret not thyself because of evildoers. They're like a flower. When you look around, they're going to be gone. Life here is short, honey, even if you live a hundred and some years. In God's mind, it's a moment. Don't do everything based on what's for now. Plan for your eternity. Now, James 1.12 said, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Endure temptations. Pastor C, when he was a young preacher, was around a spiritual leader who made a physical pass at him. He had to literally go running down the street. Endure temptation. Amen. Let me wrap this up. So these are the end times. We are end time warriors. We are in a race. We're supposed to live a life where we pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus. We're supposed to know that we're in this world, but we are not of this world. We're supposed to not spend 90% of our time just focused on the world. We have a course. We have to run it. Our race is being watched. Did you know you're being watched? We're being compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. It's just like the Olympic races. Not only are being, we are being watched by witnesses, we're being watched by God. And I believe, like Elder Ken said a couple of weeks ago, our competition is not with the people running next to us. Mm -mm. You have your course, I have my course to run. I'm running a certain way because I have a specific amount of time to finish my course. Look at somebody and tell them, you're on the clock. You don't have 500 years to get this stuff done. You're on the clock. Hebrews 9.27 says, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. We have a course. There is a plan for our lives. We didn't set it up. You didn't get to determine what country you would be born in, who your parents would be, what you would look like, your race. You didn't get to determine none of that. You weren't in on the meeting. It was set up in advance. There was no voting or bargaining. 
you did not get the chance to decide if you would stand before God in the last days after you leave here. We're going to all stand before him yes. by ourselves. Yes. It's not going to be a family judgment. It's going to be you. Yes. And you can't opt out of the appointment. You can't say, okay, let me let my lawyer stand in for me and speak for me. I'll send somebody on my behalf. You can't miss the appointment. Keep your eyes on the prize. Your prize is eternity with the Lord. You get to choose how deep with God you're going to go. Jesus was your example. He stayed in his lane. Jesus could have been healing people all day long, all night long. He could have been raising people from the grave all night long. He said, no, I do what the Father tells me to do, period. It's important. Jesus, he only had 33 years. He got, I said, I got something to do. I come that the people would be saved. I have a mission. I had to focus on that. He didn't want to die. He said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Some of us don't understand how death, it wasn't just a physical torture. It was him being separated from his father. We will never understand what that's like for Jesus. He paid that price. He endured. Why? For the joy set before him. I got a course. I got to run my race. For the joy. Who was the joy? You were the joy. He saw you. Individually and corporately. He saw the body of Christ. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Amen. Now, I want to be like Paul when he was his time to go. In 2 Timothy 4 5, he's talking to Timothy. He says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. He says, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I want to be able to say that. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I want to be able to say that. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Those that love the appearing and waiting for Jesus to come, they're going to live a certain way because they know he's coming. There's a crown for you. In heaven, a crown is waiting for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that great day of his turn, return. Stand up, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, oh God. I don't know about you, but I want to serve the purpose of God in my generation. I want to serve his purpose while I'm alive. What is on your heart, Lord? Tell me what to do. Let me know your will, and I will follow you. I delight, I delight to do your will. If that's your heart, just close your eyes. I'm talking to saints now. I know you should be tired of just church as usual and the messiness and the foolishness of the world. This is not about religion. This is about your relationship with your God. Because everything else is temporary. When you stand before him, you want him to say, well done. Think about what the athletes do all they go through just to get a, a ribbon around their neck. What he gives us will last forever. I want to serve your purpose, oh God, in my generation. I want to serve your purpose, oh God, while I'm alive, I want to live my life for something that will last forever. Oh, I delight, I delight to do your will. What is on your heart? Tell me what to do.
heart for each of us. Each of us have a lane. Each of us have a course. There's something you've called us to do that nobody else can do. And we have to give it an answer for what we did in this life. And you've given us all the tools. You've given us weapons and armor. You've given us the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith. You've given us an army of angels. You've given us the Holy Spirit who prays for us and through us. You've given us your word, your promises, the body of Christ. You've given us so much. And you're not looking for us to be perfect. You just want us to be willing vessels. You're not excited about our little degrees and who we know and where we've been and what we think we can do. You love a contrite heart. You love a heart that says, Lord God, I need you, I need you. Nobody but you, I need you, Lord. I want to serve your purpose, oh God, in my generation. I want to live for something that's going to last forever. heart, just raise your hands to the Lord, not to me. You don't have to come to the altar. This is between you and God. Say, Lord, I want to do your will. I want to finish my course. I want to complete what you've given for me to do. I know I have to stand before you and answer for my life. Have your way, oh God. Help me to stay on my course. Help me not be distracted with sin and lust and fear and pride. Help me, oh God. Help me shake off depression. We ain't got time to be depressed. We got to shake it off. The Lord told me I've already opened up the prison cells. I've already unleashed the shackles. All you got to do is shake them off, get up, and walk out of that cell. I've given you power. I've given you my word. Use it. Use what I said. Speak life over yourself. Stop speaking negativity. Stop speaking curses. Say what I said about you. You are blessed. You are healed. You are delivered. You are set free. Let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say I am rich. I am healed. I am victorious. Because you say so, God. And it's not us by ourselves. We got the whole army of heaven standing behind us, rooting us on. We're like in the Olympics. We're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And they're saying, run your race. Don't stop. Run, run. Keep running. Keep your eyes on the prize. Don't stop. Don't turn around. Hey, everything for our good and for your glory. You use every pain, every sickness, every issue, every concern to make us conform to the image of Christ, to conform us to the image of Christ. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. You say yes to the Lord if that's what's in your heart. You say yes to the Lord. Say yes. It's not an easy yes because you're going to have to go through. But you're going to go through whether you're saved or not. People unsaved is going through and going to hell. So you might as well go for you, Jesus, and end up with glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're not saved, you can start on that course with Jesus. He gave you a choice. You can choose life instead of death. All you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, I believe you. I accept the fact that you died on the cross for me. Be my savior. Forgive me for my sins. I come to you. Save me, oh God. Save me, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
turn to somebody and tell them, finish your course. Don't be discouraged. Keep on pressing. Encourage one another. Keep on pressing. Keep on going through. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.